My name is Doug Castor. I'm responsible for InterDigital's future wireless technology platforms. And we're here at Mobile World Congress showing a demonstration on EdgeHall. EdgeHall is our multi-gigabit per second wireless connectivity platform that can be used for uh, small cell dense deployments, residential broadband, uh, and also wireless extensions to cable Wi-Fi systems. But we're also using this for our future 5G research where we're addressing challenges such as uh, the latency, lower latencies that's required, higher data rates in the systems, and we're demonstrating this across a telepresence demo, uh, because telepresence is one of the 5G applications that demands lower latency and higher capacity. Uh, so also with 5G challenges, we're looking at some of the flexibility that's needed for future, uh, future networks. Operators are looking for ways they can have programmability in their networks so that they can support being able to share the networks across um, and create multiple independent networks that can be shared across common hardware. Uh, so what Edge Hall consists of is it's a phased array antenna as for radio, a 60 gigahertz phased array antenna that can be steered to support multiple users simultaneously. We have a Y gig baseband chip which sits on top of that uh, and the Y gig baseband chip is, uh, is a 2 gigahertz bandwidth SOC. Y gig is the next generation of Wi-Fi that, uh, that will enable those future data rates. Um, but what InterDigital has been uh, spending a lot of time working on is our mesh software solution. And our mesh software solution provides in-band signaling to support configuring the, um, the, the directional mesh network and be able to set up multiple traffic flows through the system as well as um, configure, uh, con configure other links, backup links, so that we have a reliable and very flexible mesh system. So InterDigital is excited to be part of the 5G Crosshall project and we're looking forward to bringing Edge Hall and our Edge Hall technology into 5G Crosshall where in 5G Crosshall they're looking at the control plane and data plane solutions for integrated front hall and back hall solutions and in the industry front hall is being investigated heavily and the, the operators want to be able to support front hall so they can centralize, uh, centralize the data processing. But this has got to be done in such a way that um, is suitable for transport networks, in particular wireless transport networks because we can't put fiber everywhere. So with Edge Hall as a wireless transport solution, um, we'll look to be able to use the SDN and open, open flow uh, techniques that we've developed in Edge Hall. Um, in an open daylight platform with open vSwitch so that we can look at all the trade-offs between front hall and back hall and also have that open source platform that we can use to better work with our partners in, in investigating how to optimize front hall and back hall integrated into 5G networks. So we're looking forward to bringing Edge Hall into the 5G cross hall project and our Edge Hall technology and participating in the uh, test beds that are planned for later this year. Hello, my name is Thomas Hausstein. I'm heading the wireless department at Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute. And we are partner in the 5G Crosshole project. 5G Crosshole is a, a Horizon 2020 project and is addressing the capacity needs of future networks. We're expecting a thousand fold capacity in demand over the uh, coming years, and that's only to be covered with more spectrum and smaller cells. But if we deploy all these small cells and more bandwidths, we need to backhaul all this capacity into the network. And that's what we are addressing. And one particular part is really building up such powerful backhaul and frontal network. As you can see, we have really a fiber network deployed and wherever we cannot deploy the fiber because of different reasons we can have uh, wireless extensions using millimeter wave or microwave uh, extensions towards remote radio hats or using copper in buildings or really having millimeter wave in backhaul and in particular if you use millimeter wave in backhaul then we advocate to do this in a meshed manner. Why meshed? That gives the redundancy of multipath routing. So from this point, you can go this way or the other way. 
and that also allows really to do load balancing if we have imbalances in the excess uh, capacity uh, demand. And everything what we do in Exol in the 5G crossover project in the end will be implemented in the 5G Berlin testbed. 5G Berlin is an integrated testbed providing open access technology, open photonics technology, and also an open 5G core all in one place, and that will be used to integrate the different uh, cross-hole technologies to be developed in the 5G cross-hole project. What we brought here for the 5G cross-hole meshed millimeter wave backhaul network is one particular link exemplarily embedded here. What you see is a, a box, a node transmitting uh, almost a gigabit to the other side, to the other end, having a long link uh, in reality uh, that's capable of a couple of hundred meters transmitting at 60 gigahertz and in total one and a half gigabits per second. And we can have a split in uplink and downlink like here, uh, 800 each direction or we can have this in a more imbalanced way, 10% one way, 90% in the other way. This millimeter wavelength is based on IEEE A.211 AD technology, also known as YGIG. Another very important ingredient for efficient font holding is really to compress digital data whenever there is redundancy in the data stream. And that often happens, for instance, in IQ data we use between the baseband unit and remote radio heads. What I will show here is a massive MIMO radio head having eight antennas. You see a module here and a baseband unit. They are connected with a six gigabits per second SIPRI link, usually transmitting the data, IQ data, for four antennas of 20 megahertz bandwidth. When doing SIPRI compression, as we do here, with a ratio of three over one, we can send up to 16 uh, data streams uh, or 12 data streams uh, in parallel over the same link. That makes uh, the same capacity uh, better utilized and is a very important contribution in the sense of an uh, efficient uh, frontal network. I'm Alberto Diez from Cornego Dynamics and we have a demo here that we are showing a complete core network uh, installed in a uh, new ARM uh, processor and that's a very compact server from Freescale from NXP where we are showing the complete core network and that's connected with a small cell and a, a smartphone which is here in the Faraday cage that it uh, has our own SIM card and connecting to the LTE network and accessing internet through that. So in the 5G cross hole project, what we are doing is uh, also having the core network connected to this dynamic front hole and back hole, and we are adapting the core network for, for the situation. So additionally to that, we are also working with this board, which is an SDR board that permits us to install a complete EnodeB, but as well uh, XPU unit, where we are going to be able to install processing units and using the um, dynamic C-run split, we're going to be able to decide dynamically if it's a front hole or a back hole what we're going to have there. And that's part of what uh, we're going to be doing in the, in the 5G cross hole project. Good morning. Welcome to the CDDC booth at Mobile World Congress 2016. And uh, we're going to present you a demo for the 5G cross hole project. Uh, but before going into the details, uh, let, let me introduce myself. My name is Josep Manges. I'm head of the Communication Networks Division at CDC, and together with my colleague Ricard Bilalta, uh, we're going to do a demo of the control plane of 5G Crosscode. But fi what is 5G Crosscode? What's, what's the goal of 5G Crosscode? So uh, 5G Crosscode is about integrating the front hole and the back hole. Um, what's the rationale behind doing that? So up to now, what you see is that there are two kinds of networks, the front hole one 
and the backhoe one, which use different technologies, different equipment, they are managed in different ways. Uh, so we want to, to uh, get rid of these inefficiencies and we want to have a single unified network that is capable of serving uh, all the requirements of the flow of both front hole and back hole and at the same time consider all uh, radio functional splits. Um, and how do we do that? We do it with two main things. First one is a unified data plane. Uh, basically, this means that we are designing uh, a new uh, frame, the, what we call the cross call common frame, um, which will be able to serve all these needs. And not only the common frame, but we are also designing the devices, the cross call for wiring entities that will switch these frames to handle all, all this heterogeneity of flows. And the second main thing that we are doing in the project is uh, what we call the cross-call control infrastructure, which is a unified control infrastructure that uh, takes all these wireless and optical domains, different domains, um, though they all switch the same common frame, and give an end-to-end -end view, a unified end-to-end -end view that exposes an interface to the, to the operator, a single interface, through which it can control end to end all these heterogeneities in uh, all this heterogeneity of technologies and provide this end to end service on top of it. So, without any further ado, what you will see in this demo is the control plane part. It's a hierarchical control plane with both wireless and optical domains. Each will have its own controller and then a hierarchy. Uh, the, the parent controller, we control all this hierarchy and give this end-to-end -end view that we mentioned. And now let's move to the demo with Ricard Vilalta. Hi, this. I am Ricard Vilalta from CATC. Now I will show you the demo from the 5G cross hall that we have prepared in our booth. It's basically about SDN and orchestrating networks. You will see that in this demo we have uh, emulated several data planes but uh, all the control plane uh, software is running on this, on this laptop, uh, so in several virtual machines. Uh, for, the, for the emulated data planes, you, you see that uh, we have used Mininet, and for the control planes, uh, we are using uh, several SDN controllers and our own SDN orchestrator, as, uh, running as a child or as a parent. This is about hierarchical SDN orchestration, so uh, we have several levels of uh, orchestration, of hierarchy uh, of orchestration. Uh, first, let me show you the screen. Uh, we have one wireless domain, we have uh, one packet domain uh, controlled by an SDN controller, and an optical domain. The optical domain is, control is controlled by an active stateful PC. Let me show you in the demo. So it's running here. It's a five, a four-node uh, optical no no domain. It's controlled by an active stateful PCE with instantiation capabilities. We like to say it's an optical SDN controller. For the packet domain, we can see that we are using a, a standard open daylight for SDN controller. For the wireless domain, we are using real, so we don't have a, a script capture. But you can see a child controller. Child controller is taking care of both the optical domain and the packet domain. This is the first SDN orchestration. It's about it's a client orchestrator. If you see, this is an, an optical node. This is a packet node. These are both orchestrated, and we are able to provide end-to-end -end connectivity between these different uh, layers. In this demo, we have done one step higher and we are presenting a hierarchical approach so that all this control and all this orchestrator is able to abstract this network and uh, if this network can be seen as a node in the for the parent control so if you take a look at the parent all the underlying optical and pattern network is seen as a single node this is the abstracted node that is representing the whole transport network 
in, uh, in this demo, we will provide a connection between the wireless domain and this transport network, and we will see how all the necessary orchestration is performed in order to trigger this end-to-end -end connectivity. So, I will create a call between an input port in the wireless domain and an output port in the transport domain. I need to select first the wireless domain port and then the output port in the transport domain. I will create this connection. The connection has been triggered. The connection has been created. We will take a look at the parent controller. We will see that the connection has been done. So we have connection. Let's see what has happened in the client controller. If we go to the client controller, we see many things. First one, we see that the link has been created. This is a virtual link because we have established an optical connection and this optical connection is being used as a, as a layer 2 connection on the higher domain. So this virtual link has appeared here. We see also the, the connections in the optical domain has been established. This is the optical domain and we see the end-to-end -end connection. This, of course, was uh, performed from the parent controller to the node, to the, to the abstracted node, and this has been translated into all the necessary uh, commands in the, in, the, in the client orchestrator. So if we take a look at Open Daylight, we are able to see that all the flows have been created, have been generated for the packet domain. This is the source and MAC address that we have configured for our end-to-end -end call. And we see that it has established first the optical connection, then we have established all the optical, all the packet flows in the packet domain, and only we have also established the necessary connections in the wireless domain. This is what I wanted to show you today, and thank you very much for your attention.